Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Anna Allred, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar will be on July 14th with Catherine Grant on best practices for working in family searches shared family tree. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our websites are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Baker, who will be giving a presentation on getting the most out of MyHeritage DNA. Mr. Baker has been an active genealogist for the past 15 years. In 2011, he completed the Board of Certification of Genealogists requirements to become board, a board certified genealogist with a specialty in German genealogy research. He also specializes in Midwest US early American research and DNA. He was an officer of the Sacramento German Genealogy Society and contributed numerous articles to its quarterly publication, Der Blumenbaum. He also wrote articles for the National Genealogical Society magazine and the NGS Quarterly. He volunteered for, for over 10 years at the Sacramento Regional Family History Library. He has presented a total of nine webinars for Legacy Family Tree and for the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree Communities. Beginning in 2012, he has given over 400 presentations to over 50 genealogy societies at local, regional, and national genealogy events. Mr. Baker earned a PhD in sociology and social psychology from the University of Utah. He is retired from an aerospace and business management career. In his work career, he consulted for many large companies, including Boeing, General Electric, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon. He has been an adjunct professor at sociology at UCLA and USC. His most fun job was being the piano man at Shakey's Pizza Parlor. And James, if you are ready, we will turn the time over to you. I'm, I'm ready. Let's see, what do I do, Anna? Push, uh, I push the button for share screen? Yeah. No, that's not the one. It's a green one. The green one? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, maybe I did it right then. Do you want to continue? Yes, and let's see now. Here is, I'll click on my, on the one that I think is the right one, slideshow from the beginning, slideshow from the beginning. And I think we've done it. So, uh, Anna, thank you for that fine introduction. And now I would like to add my own welcome to everyone who is, is participating today. And you see, there's the title of the topic of the day which is to do with the MyHeritage DNA features. And there will be a lot of things to talk about within the world of MyHeritage. So we'll talk about some of its special features that are really quite different from some of the other sites, notably Ancestry. And we'll talk about uh, the use of their browser, their shared matches. They have a special cluster tool that we'll talk about. So that's the direction we're going today. I've listed my heritage up at the second one there. My heritage and ancestry are really the only two, the only two companies that really are big with regular, I'll call it regular genealogy, and also do DNA. There are some others, as you see down below, some of them that are strictly regular genealogy and then some others that are strictly DNA. And then there are some smaller companies in each area that I've not listed. But we're going in the direction now of talking about my heritage and how as number two, it fits into this system of things. There's an ad for my heritage. And I presume that many of you are already on MyHeritage, uh, if you're not, 
I will, uh, I'll tell you that one of my goals today is to tell you enough good things about it that you will want to be there. And incidentally, maybe it will be free for you. Now look at this, if you go to the site, this is what they will offer you. They're interested in building up their database. And so you can upload your DNA for if you're on one of the other sites like Ancestry, or I think any of the others, they will also take your data and it's, it's, uh, you just follow a few steps and it's free. And so here, if you push that upload button, this is what it tells you to do. It, 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 it guides you through the whole process. So uh, while we're talking about these different companies, let me suggest a really good strategy for you. Start off, and this is because it's the big one. And so you want to take the regular Family Finder Ancestry DNA test for which on sale, you'll pay about 59 bucks for that. And then look at that for free, you transfer that data to MyHeritage, to FTDNA, to GEDmatch, and uh, let's see, also uh, Living DNA, you can go there. 23andMe wants you to pay special. Now that talking more about that download upload process, I know that some people are not really into a lot of download upload technology. And so marked in red for the non-computer people, if you think this process is a little tricky, you just get your technical friend to help. And maybe that's a teenager or a younger person who's really familiar with, with how to do this kind of thing. Third bullet there, when you transfer the data, it's not going to happen instantaneously. Apparently, they're going through a lot of gyrations to massage that data. And so they want to get it into their system and see who all you match within the world of my heritage. And each company does that. Each company has its own special algorithms and has its own scorekeeping system. And so that's what you will expect. All right, we've now come to the opening page of My Heritage. We presume that we are now in the club. And so I've uh, put an arrow there by the DNA area where you can select different things to learn about and to take a look at as you go through what they have found for you on uh, you, we're probably going to look more at the DNA matches because that's that's really where it's at and that's where you're going to get the help one thing you want to do is probably you want to load your own database there and so you can see that I have done that and so on the left hand side you see that that I have a good sized tree there and then they're showing me that at the time that I took this, this uh, snapshot, there were some 9,000 plus DNA matches that I have with DNA. That's a fair number, but I know some people have, have many more than that. All right, so now, now how do we get there to where we wanna go? You, I put a big star on that area where it says DNA matches. So we'll click there and we've clicked there. This is the opening page. And now they're going to show you that they have all of these thousands of matches. I took this screenshot a few months ago, maybe a year ago, because it's showing just 5,000 matches. As I said, I'm now over 9,000. And then beginning with Darlene, there they've listed those many, many matches. And then first of all, they're going to give you information about each one. So the double blue arrows coming down, that tells me that I have a certain score there. And if you're more familiar with scores in the Santa Morgan world, that's a 237. 
So I know that that's a pretty good score they're suggesting. Maybe it's a first cousin once removed, a second cousin, something like that. It turns out she's going to be a second cousin once removed. Looking around on this page, on the right-hand side, see where there are different filters and different ways to sort your data. We will uh, we'll typically sort it from highest score to lowest score. And then coming down, I have some arrows opposite the information on Darlene, where you can look at her tree or information about whatever there is to say about that. Let me talk about number of matches. My heritage just kind of got into this game a little later than Ancestry and a little later than FTDNA. I transferred my matches there about three years ago and they started me with 3,700. So now up to, to the present time, I'm now sitting at almost, I'm gonna break 10,000 in the next few weeks. So this is an indication that my heritage themselves are making rapid strides to build up the size of their database. Now, to make the law of large numbers is that the more matches you have, the more likely you're going to find people who match you in a good representation in all of your different family subgroups. You, you know, this, your fourth, uh, you know, your, say all four of your grandparents, uh, eight of your great grandparents and so on. So uh, we want, you know, maybe you want to, to look at particular subfamily groups and you need a good number of matches to do that. Now you can do that with Ancestry because they've got a lot of matches. I haven't quite reached that stage. I think maybe you need 15, 20,000 to really get a good representation. Now at present, I'll say that I have a fair representation. And I'm gonna give you a flashback here, which is, um, um, this is now about six years ago when I started with Ancestry and they started at that time, they had with me 4,000 matches. And that, I thought that was a pretty big number, but, uh, and indeed I dug in and began to find a lot of good relatives for different family groups, but some of the groups I could not find matches. Well, over time that database has grown. I'm now sitting at over 27,000 matches and I have pretty good representation for all of my different several groups. And so, so here's what had happened with a smaller database. Some of my third cousin groups were missing, but see with that fan chart, if you, if you look three, let's see, one, two, three, four concentric circles out where I put the stars, for those people, if people match me at that level, although they might come up a different route, but that's our common ancestor for like on the left, uh, Maria Martin, uh, on the right, uh, Herman Westling. If I'm looking for, for people who also share with those people, they will be my third cousins. But I've learned that you kind of need a pretty good sized database to be able to have good coverage and get good representation at that level. Now, happily, MyHeritage is growing its database. A year or two from now, I think they're going to really be, be you know, I'll call them really good, but uh, it, it's valuable just the way it is. Now, one thing, see, I have say, 9,000 and some on my heritage, 27,000 on, on ancestry. So if you come to my heritage, it means you're going to get another, say one third more to add to your group. So that should be worthwhile. And you'll probably find matches who did not test 
on ancestry. People just seem to like to go to one site and that's where they sit with their, with their DNA materials. Now, if, if you find people who were already on ancestry, now you're going to be able to get more detailed data on them and that will be good. Now, let's go back where we were and we're going to, to look at that top arrow where it says, how do you want to sort your data? Well, the, my most typical way is just the shared data, the, the highest score to the lowest score. Or look at that, I could do it a couple of other ways. The people who have the most shared segments or the largest segment, that, that could be important. Or if I just simply want to find somebody and look at their name, first name or last name, or maybe I just want to look at the people who are new so that if you haven't visited your, your site for a while, say once every month or every six weeks, you can go back and look and see who has joined in that, that might be helpful for you. Now look, on the very right where that kind of a magnifying glass is, uh, you click on that. And then if you want to look up a person with a particular name, and we all, you know, we often want to do that. And so like here, I have put in the name of one of my great grandfathers, uh, Kaler, that's a kind of a German name. And so when I put that in and click on it, the upper left-hand arrow, see they're showing seven people that they have found who have listed the name Kohler either in their database or their tree or something. And so, so those seven people might be valuable for me. And in fact, the next arrow over, you look and see that Cynthia, has a good score, 116. That's like a score of usually a, maybe a second cousin. Actually, she's going to turn out to be, I think, a third cousin. And there are other Kalers down the page. So this time we're going to scroll way down to the right-hand side. I'm just showing you all the things that you see on that front page. So this is where they give you a choice. How many do you want to see on each page? So let's look at that. Now, the, the default position is, is 10. Now, I'd like to look at more than that so I don't have to, to bump the page too often. And so I'd rather uh, have 50. And so generally, that's the way that I'm going to set mine up with 50 on each page. All right, now, now I've, I've scrolled down. Remember we were looking at Cynthia. And so I've scrolled down just to take a more in-depth look at her. So this is to give you an idea of what you get when you look at, at your, any of these people. So, it's, it's telling me a little bit about her data profile, uh, how old she is, where she comes from. And then it says that she has a family tree with 67 people. And, uh, and she has a really good score, 116. Now that's going to be probably in the area of a second or a third cousin. And then there are other things where those two right-hand arrows are. If I want to look at her tree, or I want to see who does she have for matches. So let's go there. And so here we're looking at her tree. And as I look at her tree, she's on the left and there's her father and grandfather and so on. And where my right hand arrow is, I recognize that name because Johann Jacob Kaler, that is my great, great, great grandfather. And I already have data on him, but I don't have it on. I, I know nothing about Cynthia and her people, but I know that when the family came to America, 
my people were in Illinois and some other people went off to Kansas. And so she's part of that Kansas group. But look at how, how easy this was. Can DNA analysis really be this easy? Now I showed you the other arrow where we said review the DNA match. And so in a moment, we'll scroll down there and we'll get more data. But um, <clears throat> just to tell you and remind you that on average, a third cousin scores maybe only about 57. So she, she's getting more data, more DNA in her, uh, in whatever she has, um, more from the Kaler people than maybe a little bit more than what we might expect. So anyway, a good score for Cynthia. Now I click on more data for her and learning about her profile and, and where she has people coming from and yes, they come from Germany and she has some other people that come from Norway. They don't especially belong to me, but we share the ones from Germany. And then look in the lower part. Yeah, she's showing that her Kalers come from Germany and some of them are in Illinois and some of her people are in Kansas. So this is all just like it's supposed to be. Okay, this time we're going to click on shared matches. In the upper left, it says that, that she and I have 79 people where she matches them, I match them. And so that means probably we're matching in that Kaler family area. So the data on the left-hand side of the, of the screen is going to be people that I match and the scores and then her side is on the right. So when we look down to the first person we both match, Timothy, I get a score of 52 with him. Cynthia scores much higher. Cynthia's maybe, he's a closer relative, like maybe he's a first cousin for her, but you know, he's only a third cousin for me. And so, so it goes with Rhonda, and there's Darlene that I showed you before, my number one match, and Cynthia matches her as well. And then if we kept on going down, we would find 79 people here. Now this shared match data, you can see in every way I'm giving you the message. This is an important thing, and it's, so it's an important slide. So there's the five blue stars. I've said it's an important slide. And the thing is with my heritage, and this is much better, better, better than ancestry, because you not only learn who those matches are, but you get their scores for each of them. With ancestry, all they gave you was a yes or no. That person scores high enough to be considered a shared match. But now it is much better if we're able to tell kind of exactly, exactly what the score is. Second bullet, my heritage combines those two scores like mine and, and Cynthia's for each match and then lists the combo number in descending order. So that's a little tricky to follow, but you catch on to that very quick. But with this list, you get an immediate idea of who's sharing and in what subfamily area they are. In this case, they're in my Kaler subfamily area. Now you say, why is that so great? Why do you, why are you given the blue stars? I've often talked about how the shared match thing with ancestry is their most valuable thing because you don't even need to know much about them as long as you know that, that you have a bunch of people and they're all in a cluster and they all have shared matches with one another, that's going to represent a subfamily group. That's really good with ancestry, but it's going to be even better now with my heritage because this will indeed open new doors 
And I'm going to give you an example to really bring this one home. Here, the example comes from ancestry, but the message is going to be, it would have been 10 times easier with my heritage. Now here is the, a new match that comes up on ancestry and he comes, he becomes, uh, he's a descendant of my great grandfather. He's an Illinois person. So, so I write a note to this person. I send an email and I say, you know, who are you? Where do you fit in the family tree? She says, I don't know. I wish I knew, but I'm adopted. And I said, let's see if I can help you. So here's this fan chart that says, here's my dad, here's his father. And then Nicholas, you turn your head sideways where the blue star is. Nicholas is our common ancestor. That's this new match. So here's the story of Nicholas. He came to America, 1847, big, big family. They had big families. They've got maybe three, 4,000 descendants now. I go back there in three steps, but I'm kind of old. And so some of these people are going to be second cousins, maybe once or twice removed. On ancestry, I have found about 75 people. We all descend from Nicholas and we get good scores. Some of them are good scores. Some of them barely make the cut, it, it, you know, because there's a variation in that. Most of them are second cousins once removed or so. So how can I help the adopted woman? She gets a score of 95. And so I figure, all right, she's probably a second cousin once or twice removed. She tells me you know, how old she is. She's somewhat younger. And it takes her probably four or five steps to get back there. We have 20 shared matches on Ancestry. And I have identified all of them as being in the Nicholas Baker group. So this is the cluster. She is a bona fide second cousin, but now can we do any better than that? Like, is there a subfamily branch maybe? Well, I told you, Nicholas had a lot of children. 10 of them learned, lived to be adults. They all had children. So there are 10 different family branches. And I have been able to place a good number of those 75 people into one branch or another. Sometimes if they don't give you a tree and you're not, you, they're not cooperating, it's a little harder to tell. But I've, I've been able to tell with the majority. So to help the adopted woman, I'm going to take a hard look at those 20 people that we share matches with. Here's Nicholas's children. I descend from Joseph on the right-hand side. The question will be, can I pin down where she's, the adopted woman, where, where's she going to be? Here's my uh, the list of people, my top scores on ancestry. I've color-coded it in the right-hand column. You see the ones who descend from Nicholas Baker. They're the blue people. I had maybe more on my, on my mother's side of the house, but a good fair number. And of course, I'm only listing here the top 37. There's of course more than that. So this is the thing, my new match person had those 20 shared matches. So I said to her, I wanna know what your score is on each of those. She's a good sport, she's cooperative, she tells me, what those scores are. And so the, the scores, they, they run the gamut, yeah, but she's got some that are really high comparatively, like there's a 314. She's got several of them that score over a hundred. And so second bullet, here's the thing. She has listed her top scores there, 314, 237, now, I don't have any Baker family 
scores with Nicholas higher than 133. She's getting some that are much higher than that. So I want to look at her top five scores. So I do that. And it turns out that I know for three of them, which family group they come from. It co they come from Nicholas's daughter, Amelia. And the other two, they, they're a little bit more nebulous. These are people who didn't post a tree, didn't cooperate. But it is absolutely clear with that data, three of those people came from that one daughter. And so that is where she comes from. She descends not only from Nicholas, but I can pin her down now as coming from Nicholas' daughter, Amelia. So, so what do the scores mean? Well, it means for her, she now has some people to work with, with those higher scores, and she can begin to match more people at a closer generational level. And maybe she can even get, uh, find out who Amelia's son or daughter is that, uh, that she's connected with. So that's what you're able to do if you know the scores. Now, here's an example of some of the group. See, I had pinned down several matches who descend from Amelia, but some from some of the other children as well. The adopted woman's highest scores were all in that Amelia group. And so that's the way we, we could pin it down. The beauty of the My Heritage numbers are that you don't have to ask the other person, the scores are right there on the page. And so like, in other words, I would not have had to go through, I would have known immediately what scores she had because my heritage tells you. So that's why those scores are so valuable. Now let's uh, come back to, uh, we got sidetracked there, but now we're coming back to that third cousin of mine who had all the matches, 70 of them. And so I want to show you the chromosome browser. We click on her, Cynthia, and the chromosome browser. And here's a few places, a few different chromosomes where she and I match. So now you can click further on those to see what's the size of the segment and what are the start and stop points. But what we're going to want to see are not only Cynthia, but who else? Now, like here's one on chromosome 12, there's a 31 point segment. I mean, that is, that's real. That is not, I mean, she, she belongs to me. So, so that's the kind of data that we're getting here. So in the advanced options that they have, see in the upper right, advanced options, we're going to now download data for several different people. Now we know what, what the data is for Cynthia, and here I can see on several places, several different chromosomes, she really scores big. She really has good stuff there. But now we want to build a cluster if we can. So this time we're going to look at Cynthia and some other people. We're going to use the chromosome browser. So I already know because see, we did the shared match routine. So we know who we want to look at specifically that probably has good matches on the chromosome business. So here I've picked off six of them, <clears throat> this color coded. And so, so to look down there on chromosome number five, there you see where a bunch of these people are joining in. And some of them are absolutely overlapping one another. And so that seems to be that family's area in that chromosome. But see how you can see that. That's that's just you can you get a really quick idea of who's matching who and on which one of those chromosomes. Now here was a case of where it was not uh, 
it was not Cynthia, but two of the others that just matched perfectly. And then down there on number 12, we get Cynthia matching somebody really good. Now, I have played around with this, not only on my heritage, but on FTDNA and on, um, oh, a little bit on JID um, uh, match. And so anyway, here on the left-hand side, you see I've kind of begun to build a, a, uh, build a case here where for different chromosomes, different areas, different segments in that chromosome, different ones of my subfamily groups really come in big and, and ac actually define kind of a cluster. And so you see here, I've got several different family groups and, and that works so well. And my heritage particularly can really help you with that. Now, see, this is something Ancestry is not playing because they don't have the browser. Now, as you, as you analyze your people, probably your, your top scores are going to give you most of your good data, not all of it, but, but some of it. So uh, I have found that it's, it's valuable to kind of build, build a chart. And so, you know, the, so this is what I've done. So you see here, here we are, here's Darlene and down the way there's Cynthia and some of the rest of them. And on the right-hand side, I've marked which, which family branch do we all descend from Nicholas or on my uh, mother's side, my other great-grandfather Harmon, or down the way you see third cousins that are, that's green, see the green, Perry, and then see some purple ones. I've got another group, the Elifritz group. So you can see I've, I've sort of listed the top scorers and then I've identified what's the relationship and, and where do they, uh, how can I place those people? In, let's see, it's two years ago now that uh, my heritage came out with a new tool. And this really became kind of a useful thing. And they're calling it a cluster finder. And so, you know, we've talked about how useful it is to identify a cluster, because if we've got a cluster, then we kind of know which subfamily group it is where all those people are matching together. Well, up above there, a couple slides ago, you can see that I was working on this, but now it gets even better because my heritage will do this for us. So here we are back to, uh, back to that front page under the DNA options. And one of them is the DNA tools. And so you click on that, that's where you find their data on the browser. Also, you see that's where they have their automatic, their auto clusters, and they also have their ethnicities map there. But we're looking at auto clusters now. So we click on that and they do their stuff. And here's what they have done. They have built a cluster, each one of those blocks, starting in the upper left, kind of a pinkish one, and then yellow, yellow, green, all of those different ones, those are different clusters where a number of my matches kind of match one another and they match me. And so on the right-hand side, you see they have listed these different clusters and they just number them according to which one is the largest. And then go to the very bottom right, and you see that this is where they say they have selected everybody in that, in that top group. I think they've picked about the top, everybody with a score down to, uh, oh, whatever it was. And then if they have at least a 10 centimorgan score with, with somebody else. 
in the lower left, those, uh, it says, yeah, there's 97 people and they looked at the ones who scored higher than 30. So by the time you're down to a score of 30, you probably are almost at the fourth cousin level. So, so the, um, beginning at the top there, these different clusters, some people, depending on their scores, they will match as first cousin, second, third, sometimes fourth. So now what do I have? They've done their magic. I've got 18 different clusters. And so now I'm gonna take a look at each one of those clusters. So I'm just picking one kind of at random, one that's not too large, not too small, kind of like the Goldilocks thing. And so, so uh, this cluster number four has eight people in it. And so let's look at those four people. So here they've listed them. And I recognize some of their names because I've already done some work here. And I know that they are all going back to a man named Ella Fritz. This is the Ella Fritz family. And, and so because they all are matching one another in a big way, and they're all Ella Fritz people. So all of a sudden I have matched, I've figured that out. Now, they give you updates, of course, every day in the world, there are more people that join in. And so from time to time, you maybe want to check that cluster data. The bad news, it's not all that bad, but because they number the clusters according to which gets the most, maybe one cluster gets bumped because another one. So be careful that you're watching the same cluster that you did last time. So I checked this maybe, uh, oh, it's now six months ago, but now I'm up to 20 clusters. And so, so again, here I've taken a little bit different look this time. See, this time, if you squint, you know, you got to do more than squint. Well, I could blow it up, the names, but it's the names of the people on both the top axis and the left hand axis. And you can see, who was matching who? And then this is just another way to look at those clusters. All right, we've come down to the bottom of the last slide. And, and then they've just added a few people over that time period. Um, now you can also, if you want to, you can have, you can press a button and they will list those clusters out in an Excel format. So if uh, you can play around with this different, different ideas. All right, now I started to get to do business with the browser here. In fact, we had some browser examples, but now we're working on those people that are cluster people. So here it was cluster number four, and here are, they were eight people they'll allow me to look at seven at once. So I'm going to do that. And look at that. Here the seven people are. Look at chromosome number 14. You can't make this stuff up. This is a perfect storm. All of those people are matching one another. And number 14 is the big one. And you just know that those people, they're all Ella Fritz people, and that's where they're getting that match data, the DNA stuff from chromosome 14. Now it gets even better because if you hover over any of those, you can see exactly the size of that particular centimorgan. In this case, it's a 44 point centimorgan. So that's really big. Now, of course, you want to keep score with the clusters. And so I have built a new column. And I've built, I've also marked down the names of the people on the left hand side. See where the arrow is? My heritage clusters. And so cluster number one, 
And so I list not only the people, but then I say, which group do they belong to? And you can see I've color coded some of them down the way. And you can see that some of them are my Baker people, some are Ella Fritz, Perry, different ones. And now I've updated my chart so that I have a special column that is my cluster column. See, it's about the third one over from the right next to the relationship. So like I know who's in cluster number five or three or whatever. Uh, because you couldn't see that so well, I've kind of blown it up to see. You can see I've listed the names and then I've listed, you know, which group, is it a Perry group or a Baker or which one? And then here is that cluster column that I now want to look at. And so, so that becomes kind of helpful. Now, my heritage only gives you cluster data on the people who scored more than 30. But now it's going to get better because any of the people that they match, we can kind of look at them and check their scores using the browser, the ones who scored less than 30. And even if they did not put in a tree or a detailed tree, we can tell which ones are matching us in like who else matches the cluster for people. They are also going to be Ella Fritz people. And so last bullet, indeed, this is a way that you can jumpstart a lot of your DNA research. New topic, my heritage hints. Once you're in the club, as soon as you have your data there, they will periodically, like about every three days, they'll send you a message and say, we found somebody for you. And maybe it's on the regular genealogy side, maybe it's on the DNA side. But, uh, but that's kind of good to know that, you know, if all of a sudden a really hot number pops up, they'll tell you about it. So now I've expanded my, my chart a little bit and see, I've gone down my first 100 or so names of my heritage people. And you can see that I've got pretty good representation of my different subfamily groups. See, there's uh, you know seven or eight or nine different ones. Now, it's still not as good. See, I want you to kind of get the color, the big flash of color, because now we go to ancestry and you see there's a lot more color and a lot more different branches have been filled in and it's just because it's that law of lar art large numbers see now here i've listed oh about 20 different subfamily branches and ancestry has found some representative people for each one of those and some of them right-hand columns, some of them are down there, fifth cousins, fourth cousins. Uh, but now look comparatively, my heritage at present, it's got a smaller database. And so it has not been quite as helpful in finding all of those fourth and fifth and different cousins, not quite like ancestry did. But I think that will come in time. Now, one other thing that they do, of course, is just like all of the sites, they play ethnicity estimate. And uh, if you've listened to my stories before, you'll know that I have very different ethnicity estimates from different companies. And so I don't put as much stock in there as, as some people do. We have come to the end and we're in good time. And so let me, uh, let me refresh you with uh, a few takeaways that, that you really, what was the message of the day? All right, here it was 
both my heritage and ancestry are the two probably biggest and best of the companies who have both the DNA and the research capability. My advice, take the ancestry test first, pay your $59, and then you transfer the data to my heritage for free. And you know, who could ask for anything better than that? At, at present, my heritage has a little bit of a smaller database than we want, but it's going to grow. And in a year or two, it's going to, it'll be there. And they're, they're trying, they're doing all they can to make it larger. My heritage offers a number of options to uh, present your match data. And we talked about some of those where you like, you select a person's name, you select the ones with the, that just came about most recently, the add-ons. And uh, then be aware of that surname selection option. We tried that, I, I gave you the example, everybody who uh, is connected with a Kaler. Now, uh, you may want to modify the default position and get up to 50 matches on the page. And then one good thing that they tell you, they're not only going to give you the total Centimorgan score, but they'll tell you the longest segment, which will be a useful item. And then also, you know, something I didn't tell you today is that they have another trick that is called segment analysis, where they send you a message with some data and then you get to do some wonderful things with that. And that gets to become a really valuable tool. And I get to talk about that next month. Number eight, look for the posted trees in connection with each match that will help just like it does on Ancestry. But once again, only about half the people post their trees. But uh, the basic data on each match is presented here really in a user-friendly way. You see there, you see how they show the trees. You, they, you can see a little bit about their profile. And, and that's number 10 there, there where you can check out the ancestral places for each match. This is really important, number 11, and you can see from the stars that it's going to get even more important. My heritage gives you really super detailed Santa Morgan data, not only for you, but for any of your matches as you match with them and have shared matches. So that became really important. The chromosome browser is easy to use and it's helpful. That cluster finder is just a dynamite tool. And then you want to figure out a way because you can't remember all of them, figure out a way to track your matches, either build a chart or do something like that. And so enjoy yourself with that program. I think it'll be useful for you. And we've come to the end. Anna, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Um, we have one question from Sarah Ship saying asking if there are any handouts. Uh, I can either I'll send you a handout, Anna. How will that be? Yep, and then I can post it with the website or with the video on the website. That'll be good. I'll do that in the next few minutes. Um, and then Catherine Schultz said, um, be sure to tell everybody who uploads to my heritage that to use the DNA tools, they need to pay a $29.95 unlock fee. Okay, that's good. That's good to know. Um, and then Lynn Hutchings raised a hand. Um, Lynn, do you want to type your question out? Now, what, what's your question? Uh, we had, um, wait, I can just allow her to talk. Okay, Lynn, I'm going to unmute you. So you can ask your question. Oh, okay. Lynn, go ahead. Um, 
And you actually have to hit unmute from here. Sorry. I gave you permission to unmute. Lynn, I think you're muted. I can't hear you. Okay. She doesn't have anything. Um, never mind. Um, all right. And then that's all that I see from the questions. So I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you'll join us for our next webinar, which will be on July 14th, same time, same place. Um, with Catherine Grant. Um, a record of this webinar will be made later this week, and you can do that on our YouTube channel or on our website. Um, if you have any comments or questions, you can always email me at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.